All set. So today we're going to talk about emotion and the emotional influences on learning and memory. So, so again, there'll be three parts, the behavioral processes, brain substrates, and clinical perspectives. And we'll start by defining what is emotion. So emotion has three related facets. And we can see here a variety of emotions. There are physiological responses, which are changes in heart rate, respiration, overt, which you can't see, overt responses, which is the smiling, the baring of teeth. I won't ask all of you to imitate your favorite emotion. In terms of the physiological responses, some of the, uh, some of the examples from a fear response would be heart rate increases, pupils dilate, startle response or jumping is an overt behavior, and an internal fear, feeling of fear, of anxiety, or need to flee. Um, it's been suggested that uh, there are six basic emotions, um, and all actors try to be able to present them um, as, as a way of demonstrating their acting. Happiness, surprise, fear, sadness, anger, and disgust. And whether or not that's complete um, or sufficient is sort of open to debate, but that characterizes sort of the range of emotions when people are most talking about them. Okay. The physiological components are mediated primarily by the autonomic nervous system called the sympathetic and parasympathetic. These innervate the uh, involuntary muscles and the internal organs and the glands and the hormonal system. And they activate the sympathetic portion of the, of the response produces what's often called the flight or fight response, okay, in which you see increases in blood pressure, respiration, glucose, decreases in digestion, arousal, et cetera. So there's, just, there's a whole sort of uh, stress response which we see here, okay. An important component is the release of stress hormones, which are a critical involvement in all of this sort of emotional responding. And I won't go into too much, you know, traditionally in psychology courses they spend a lot of time going through these various theories of, uh, of emotion, um, where one approach is this James Lang theory that emotional stimulus causes the body response, and that, you, that this then leads to conscious emotional feelings of interpreting it, okay? Um, the Cannon-Bard theory, which is an emotional stimulus leads to both the bodily response and the, and the emotional feelings, and then a sort of an integrated view which says you get both a cognitive appraisal and then you get the conscious feelings. And so part of this is designed to sort of understand how these different components, this, the, the, the internal autonomic responses, the overt behaviors, and the cognitive and emotional and sort of a perceptual view of it are interrelated. Um, and the basic sort of concerns was to ask, was, was to note that there are a lot of ways in which when we're excited and aroused, um, then uh, uh, we often feel the same things as when we're afraid, okay, the same internal feeling. And this is believed to be why men love to take women on roller coasters. Because you go on, you take your date on a roller coaster, and she gets kind of all excited and nervous, and if she's with you, there's a 50-50 chance she'll attribute that arousal to being with you rather than being on the roller coaster, okay? Uh, scary movies can work as well. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through all of these, but that's the basic idea, is that, is that there's a lot of ambiguity in terms of the similarity between the physiological responses to things like sexual arousal versus fear. Um, and uh, I'm not going to sort of spend much time on that. Um, and I'm going to skip over that. If you want to go through that, I'd suggest going through to the book because it's just sort of a, a long process. But that's the basic, um, the basic idea of these kinds of studies where you, for, so uh, the, the, an the analog of taking your date on, on the roller coaster and hoping she thinks she's excited because she's near you are things where you inject somebody with epinephrine, which is sort of a direct way of, of the equivalent of riding in the front of the roller coaster. Um, then you place them with somebody who's happy or angry, and then you, 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 you note that people report feeling whatever the other person was feeling. Um, and the idea is this may sort of explain some of these sort of placebo-related effects, that we're sort of interpreting our body's responses in terms of the, cog of the cognitive context. So another question that comes up is, what is emotions in, in animals? You know, we know a lot of our emotional perceptions of anger, fear, and sadness are introspective. You know, we know we're feeling angry and so forth. Um, to do research, we want to be able to do these things in animals. And there's the question is, what is, do, is, do animals feel emotions? Um, this also comes up in terms of animal rights uh, uh, protesters. So we can't ask, but we can observe. that It's often seen that consistent that, that a dog seems to be joyous when its owner returns. An elephant can seem sad at a burial, and so on and so forth. So we see animals ob with observable behaviors that mimic what we think of as being sort of emotional responses to situations that are analogous to how we might respond 
um, if we sort of anthropomorphically put ourselves in their feet or hooves. Uh, and, uh, but we don't really know if they're feeling the same thing that we're feeling. Okay. Um, but there's certainly evolutionary considerations suggest that um, we're unlikely to be qualitatively different in emotions. If emotions are such a big part of our life, that they, they, sort, of, they, they sort of emerged full-blown without having sort of been present previously seems unlikely. Um, and Darwin certainly noticed that a lot of these fear behaviors, uh, piloerection, when the hair goes up on the back of your neck, um, the startle responses, cortisol, re all of these physiological aspects seem common from animals to humans and are conserved across much of the animal kingdom. But what we don't know is whether or not there's an introspective analog between the notion of feeling fear or happiness. Um, most of the, for various reasons, although we talk about emotion generally, and I mentioned there are six emotions. I can't recall them. Can you? That's pretty good. She's probably the same one who remembered the seven dwarfs as well. Um, the, uh, which are somewhat overlapping, aren't they? You know, <laughs> dopey, disgusties, whatever, or sad, <laughs> or something. So the, uh, although there are these six or seven emotions, most, when people talk about emotional research, a lot of the time what they're talking about is fear research. Okay? Um, and for various reasons, it's focused on fear. It's indeed easiest to induce. You know, it's, e it's easy to make a rat afraid or, do, or, or to induce something that, that seems analogous to what we think of as being afraid. Um, it's not so clear how do you make a rat happy. You know, well, you give it sex or food or something. Um, but a lot of these other ones are, are sort of ambiguous. So conditioned fear, um, studied a lot, uh, particularly in the, the, the uh, parade lab here. So the basic way, a, a neutral stimulus, usually a tone, is paired with a painful stimulus, usually a shock. The CS comes to evoke a fear response, including freezing and elevated blood pressure. And it's learned quickly. It can be hard to extinguish. The fact that it's hard to extinguish um, shows up as well when we look at um, uh, clinical disorders, like anxiety and depression, where the, where the issue of the, the difficulty of extinguishing fear responses may play a role. Um, so here is... Uh, so some of the, uh, so you have, this is freezing. So freezing is basically animals like to move. Um, if you have an animal that's sedentary, then a freezing measure is not going to be a good way of indexing fear. But animals like a rat or a mouse that like to move around, if you look at them sort of freezing, the kind of deer in the headlights look, then you'll see uh, freezing after a first tone and then after the tone shock, a lot more of this freezing behavior. Um, and you can also look at blood pressure, something that's also done in humans. So after a tone shock pairing, versus after the first CS alone. Okay. Another popular paradox, so this, that's a case where you, you present an animal a, uh, a, a cue, say, and then have a shock. Another paradigm is negative reinforcement. And remember that negative reinforcement is you're reinforcing by taking away. It's often, I, I said, although, I, although we use the terms in the literature, I would have changed negative reinforcement to subtractive reinforcement. You're reinforcing based on subtracting. Um, so if the response take away an ongoing noxious stimulus, so the idea is you can, you can reward an animal. So, this is a, so unlike fear conditioning where there's something negative happening, okay, here there is something positive is going to happen if you do the right response, but that positive means something bad is going to stop. Okay? So it's two slightly different ways. Part of the idea is that a, if you press a lever, you can terminate ongoing foot shock. Okay? You swim to a platform. To be, so the stress of being in cold water, if the correct response is to get to the platform, then you're going to be relieved of that stress. Um, so one of the ways this is done is what's often called a shuttle box. So let me, we're going to demonstrate it here. Okay. Here's our subject. The light's normally on. Okay. However, so the two compartments, they're separated by a low barrier. Okay. A barrier that you can get over, but you wouldn't unless you really had to. Okay, and they're electrified floors. So, the, so conditioned avoidance, which is a very common paradigm, says if there's a response, remove the stimulus. Okay? So watch this. Okay? So the response here is that the light goes dark. Okay? And then once there's the light... That's the response? The stimulus. That's the stimulus goes dark. If the, right, so you're removing the... Um, the stimulus. Right, so if you remove the stimulus in this case here, I know it's a little bit odd, a little bit odd the way it's been set up here, um, then the floor is electrocuted and he jumps over. Did you see that? If you blinked, you missed it, okay? So the idea is that, is that when the floor is electrocuted, he can escape by going to here. This is signaled by 
the, the stimulus going dark. Okay? When the light's out, if you jump, the shock will end. Because you, not because the shock stops, but because you've moved away from it. Okay? Therefore, this light is called the discriminative stimulus. It tells you whether or not this is going to happen. So there's the consequence is that you're free from shock. The response is the jumping. So let's go through this again. So pre-training, there's no jumping. You know, you, you sit where you are. Post-training, there's the shock. And you jump. One second. Okay, there. There's the escape, the lights out, the shock applied, you jump over the barrier. Later in training, okay, um, then as soon as the light goes out, you jump before you get shocked because there's sort of a delay. And this, this way you have escape avoidance. Now one of the paradoxes of this, and so eventually whenever you, the light changes, that light goes out, you'll sort of jump to the other side, okay, is that this is maintained indefinitely and the animal will never, even if an animal never receives another shock, okay? So the idea is you, you could remove the contingency, you could remove the whole shocking thing, and the animal will continue to jump because that's sort of maintaining this escape. Um, and it brings up one of the paradoxes, which is how do you extinguish something like this? Okay, because the animal is 100% jumping, and it will maintain this behavior to avoid it. It sort of learned this. Um, and so it brought up one of these paradoxes of in the absence of continued reinforcement, how is this maintained? So what maintains this response? when the negative reinforcer is no longer experienced. Have they done studies where like, animals keep jumping even if, they, even if like, they're not giving shots to the animal? This is one of the studies that we're doing in our lab. Even though like, the, the bad thing no longer comes, this will eventually learn and then stop. Well, I think for that, you have to have a certain probabilistic responding. And I think the point is here, if you have 100% responding, you'll never discover that the contingency is stopped. OK. Um, so, one, so, so there's one of these questions that has to remain. You know, one view is that no extinction occurs because the light becomes a CS. So the idea is that the, uh, um, although this is a, is a reinf is, although this is a uh, instrumental paradigm, that eventually what happens is that is that the light becomes a CS, a cue that sort of predicts. Okay, um, let's go back here. Because uh, it's that, that predicts the outcome, and that you're sort of getting outside. You know, you're going outside the. Uh, um, the instrumental loop, um, and the other is that no expectations have been challenged, and we'll, we'll go into, I'm, I'm not going to go into these in any detail because I want to sort of jump to the brain circuits, but you can read about these in the book a little bit more, but that's sort of one of the, you can see there's a challenge between trying to understand why this is maintained. So the reason this escape avoids has become particularly popular is it's a way of, of, of creating a phenomenon known as learned helplessness, which has been used as a model system for depression, and the idea is that um, normally, the, the animals will, will learn this just fine. Um, so you have learned helplessness. But what happens is, let's go back here, learned helplessness. So here I said, there's a little barrier that the animal won't normally bother to go over. But if it knows it's going to get shocked, it will jump over it. Okay, so the idea is it's, it's high enough to be a nuisance, but not high enough to be a barrier if you need to get over it. But you could raise the barrier high enough that the animal can't get over it. Okay? And then, if you present this cue and you shock it, um, Eventually, what will happen is the animal will sort of give up on, on learning all sorts of associations. Okay? So inescapable adverse events impair later avoidance learning. So the idea is that um, the animal is exposed to several unavoidable shocks. Okay? Let's see. Let's go. Okay. Okay. So the idea is it keeps getting shocked, but it can't get out. And it's stuck. And it's whimpering. And this is, of course, a metaphoric uh, intuition about what the animal may be thinking. Life sucks. I can't escape from all these shocks. What's the point? Okay. And so what happens later is that if in later you lower the barrier, and now the animal could learn it, it doesn't, it doesn't even, even if it could. Um, so these anthropomorphic uh, in, uh, thought balloons are designed really to give the idea that, that this is uh, in many ways viewed as a model system for, for, for creating depression um, and it's one of the sort of the environmental factors that can lead to depression. Which brings me to an interesting idea. It would be interesting to actually develop 
you know, we could develop a cognitive analog of this and see how much people are susceptible to uh, learned irrelevance. This, to, 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 this is sort of similar, this learned helplessness is similar in spirit to learned irrelevance. So learned irrelevance is, do anybody remember the learned irrelevance paradigm? Okay, you should know it. I know it's something it's Catherine. I'll give you a hint. It's the, uh, from, 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 you know, Catherine and my work. Um, you know, do you know the Merlin task? In, do you ever use that in the lab? Okay, so learned, so do you all know latent inhibition? So what's latent inhibition? I know all these, there's an awful lot of terminology. Well, I guess there's more terminology in an anatomy class, so. So latent inhibition is, I present, a t it's classical conditioning. I present a tone, um, and then another tone, and I keep periodically present a tone. And, and then I do tone sh shock or something, and it takes longer to learn the tone shock or the tone air puff or the whatever, because you've, you've, bec you've essentially learned to inhibit it. And there's a lot of evidence suggesting that this is hippocampal mediated, and that it involves the cue being compressed into the background, okay? Iman, you should listen to this. I think I have an assignment for you for your new first supercard task. Um, you, I know you're studying supercard. Um, so, so we had to come up with a task that would be, so learned irrelevance is a variant on that where what you have is the tone and the shock explicitly uncorrelated in the phase one, okay? So it's very similar to this, okay? So it's explicitly uncorrelated and then in phase two, the tone is paired with a shock and, and you're slow at learning it. So the idea is that in both cases, you sort of learned in phase one that the cue is irrelevant, okay? In, at, in a classical conditioning sense. Um, and then, and that slows you down in phase two. And theories, including ours and other people's, have sort of suggested that part of what's happening is, is that you're learning that these cues are sort of no more relevant in the background context when it comes to predicting outcomes, and therefore you're less likely to, to pick up on them as cues in phase two. So either by presenting the cue alone or by having it explicitly uncorrelated with the outcome in phase one, and then in phase two you, you try to see how long it takes to learn it. Um, and if you, if you lesion the hippocampal region, particularly the entorhinal cortex, this phenomenon goes away. So it's one of the things we've used to measure hippocampal function. This learned helplessness is a an analog of latent inhibition and learned irrelevance from the, uh, in an instrumental context. So Mohammed suggests to me that we should be able to develop an instrumental version of learned helplessness um, as a, you know, obviously we're not gonna shock people, but the same idea, that, that, so the same idea, so, so we've done these studies before with latent inhibition and learned irrelevance. Um, there's this Merlin task is one that you've never seen. Oh, probably predates you. So, okay. So now the question is, so any thoughts? What, what would a, if we were to create a cognitive analog of this, what would it look like? I'd say avoid, avoiding, avoid a real shock, you know. Yeah. Can we do? And then the question, the well, or just the idea that uh, you, you could start exactly with, you know, a video, a video game where in phase one, um, they, uh, you know, sort of in phase one, there are these various cues um, and that they can't escape, you know, they can't escape, you know, and, and they get blown up and they keep losing it. And then in phase two, that there is a, uh, an escape option. Um, and the, the, there is a way that you can sort of uh, throw up a barrier, you know, to escape for something or you could get, get out. And the question is we could ask how much, you know, how much learned helplessness is there? You know, is there a lot or a little learned helplessness as an, interest, an interesting measure um, of, and I assume that might be correlated with measures of BDI and so forth? Um, how susceptible you are, you know, if you can create a nice cognitive analog of learned helplessness in a, in, a, in a video game cognitive task, it might be an interesting measure. Um, the question then is what, what neural substance is it measuring? 
other, other than the fact that it would be correlated with depressive. Yeah. Well, this is very much an instrumental escape task. You know, also, one of the things that's, you know, here they've showed this example with the, uh, the same cue. But I think one of the things that's most striking about learned helplessness is that I don't think it's not cue dependent. Like learned, you know, in learned irrelevance or latent inhibition, it's the same cue. Um, you know, the idea is that the tone that was presented in phase one is trained to become irrelevant. What makes learned helplessness um, a more interesting for our broader phenomena is it's, it's not dependent on it being the same cue. You mean it transfers to other environments? It, it transfers to other, I believe it transfers both to other environments as well as other cues. That, that if you continually put an animal, you know, you know, that it somehow sets an emotional state such that the animal becomes... It affects motivation. Mo you know, affects motivation and so forth. The idea is that is that, that, trans that generalizes to other cues and so other... Well, it's instrumental in that you're learn. You know, it's a stimu. You know, there's a stimulus, and if you respond, you avoid the consequence. Right. And you, you know, the point is that in phase two, you have the potential to avoid the consequence, and you're not. Oh, well, but the issue here is that there is no uh, there is no learned help helplessness if you are providing in phase two. I mean, the learned help helplessness, for example, rest, or what they do is that they put them in a like a small pool. Right. Right. And uh, rats ultimately, you know, kind of realize that they can't get out and they are about to, to drown. Uh huh. Yeah, so there is no exit. Right. So that's the whole point of the. But, but the point is, once you do that, does the learned helplessness only refer to helplessness about being in the pool with water? Or if you then put that rat in a box like this, uh -huh. would it also show learned helplessness in a completely different environment? Well, the point is, if it's just a, if it's a motivate, if it's a sort of a motivation, a, a belief in learning to learn, then it should transfer to any environment where there's sort of a learning to avoid an aversive outcome. Yeah. I mean, it, it has to do all this effect, effect uh, association, uh -huh. but it's uh, mm -hmm. really, uh, I, I believe it's a very Anyway, it's an interesting, interesting, you know, because this, particularly in terms of the work in depression, because this is sort of an animal model of, of, of inducing depression, yeah. it might be interesting to see if you could create an analog of it um, in such a way that you could sort of manipulate it um, in humans. Okay. So, right, we've run this before. Um, so the, the research has shown that, that learned helplessness can carry over to many tasks, as I was describing, okay? Decreasing effort and dampening mood um, motivation. Um, and that it's also possible to do the opposite, that if you show, if you sort of train people, there's an early uh, experience at controlling aversive stimuli that can diminish the negative impact of, uh, of dealing with aversive stimuli in the future. Um, and it's been suggested that this is one of the reasons why we like scary movies, you know, or why scary movies or even for children, you know, scary uh, uh, fairy tales, because it's sort of teaching us to sort of cope with, you know, you, you're, get, you're getting a controlled aversive stimulus, you know, the fearful movie, the, 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 the Grimm's fairy tales, um, even the, uh, you know, the, the scary things in the, in the amusement park, and that you're sort of learning to, to, so that, you, that you can get through them, that you can survive, that you can flourish, and that being exposed to all these things can make you more resilient, as opposed to someone who's extremely protected as a child from anything aversive, um, and then they come out in the real world and they're very susceptible to uh, learned helplessness the first time they experience something like that. So let's talk now about what's really the, so this has all been just about the background, about emotion and some of the emotional learning. Um, so very emotional events lead to vivid episodic memories. People always say, oh, I always remember where I was when I heard about 9-11, the JFK assassination, and so forth. Um, and flashbulb memories. Um, suggests that emotion can greatly increase memory encoding. Um, but there's a lot of evidence that suggests that although we all feel like, you know, hearing about 9-11 was very salient and hearing about the JFK assassination, if you're of a certain generation, was, 
Uh, it turns out that people's actually memory for the details are actually not very good. That we, oh, they, they, they never forget that they, they heard it in many ways, but then they overestimate how much the accuracy is. And although the details may change, they become very, because it's such a emotionally salient, um, it's as if some people confuse the emotional salience of a memory with the uh, validity of the details. Okay? And this often comes up in eyewitness testimony. Someone's been attacked, molested, raped. It's clearly a deeply emotionally salient event. It's something they will never forget in the sense that it'll always be you know, something they'll always remember having happened to them. But that doesn't necessarily translate into their abilities to, to recognize the perpetrator or other the details. And people sort of in a court, courtroom will sort of confuse that emotional salience of the never to forget event with the mistaken assumption that the details of what's never been forgotten are correct. So there's a, a famous story from Ulrich Neiser, one of the founders of uh, cognitive psychology, who talked about how for years he would lecture about his flashbulb memory, was hearing the news of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which was December 7th. Um, and right before his 13th birthday, and his whole memory was listening to a baseball game when the baseball game was interrupted. And he told this story for years in his class until finally someone says, but sir, nobody plays baseball in December. And he realized that, that despite 20 years of using this example in his cognitive psychology classes, it had to have been a false memory all along. And yet he had told the story so many times that it became very real. So um, again, the same thing, that people have these attribution errors that confuse the emotional salience with the details. Um, emotion does, does uh, affect our memories. Participants were told here, um, this is a story, it should, it should list who did the story, but the basic idea is that there are three parts to a story, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Okay? And the middle part of the story cha can change. Okay? So it's sort of like a substitutal version. And there's either an emotional, highly emotional, or non-emotional part. Um, and the part is, one, they're both about a visit to a hospital, but in one case it's sort of just a drill um, and you're going for like a tour. In the other case it's because of uh, you know, a terrible accident and blood and everything else and so forth. Um, and both stories have the same beginning and end and varied only in the emotional salience of the middle. And what they found is that uh, the emotional component of the story was remembered much better than the emotional condition. Okay, so here's a case where the, the, the emotional part the details are remembered. Okay. Another way in which emotion affects memory, and this is something Muhammad and I have been talking about, it's work from Gordon Bauer, who we talked about in chapter one, it's called the mood congruence. And you saw one of this in, uh, maybe it was in chapter one, uh, where, or maybe one of the earlier lectures, where we talked about the study where scuba divers studied a list on the beach or studied a list underwater, and when they were underneath it, underneath the water, above the water, they, they did better in whatever context they learned. We also saw the uh, um, other examples of the sort of congruence of, of that the, the context in which you learn something, when it's congruent with the context in which you retrieve it, improves performance. Um, mood congruence shows that um, the same thing applies for uh, your mood. So it's not only the case that if you're underwater or on the beach, you'll recall better if you're in the same place. Um, I, I discussed also that the idea of being drunk, which it's not quite a mood, but it's closer to a mood. It's an internal state. So people who um, are in a happy mood and a sad mood, which are induced by stories or movies or somehow, that people do better when uh, they're in the same mood. That they, um, as, uh, so when they're in a, in a happy mood, they recall more of the positive things. When you're in a negative mood, you recall more of the negative things. And this mood congruence in memory retrieval um, sets up a natural way of thinking about some of what happens when people are depressed. You know, you start out being depressed because your cat died, and then because you're depressed because your cat died, you remember also that your girlfriend left you, and then you remember also the other bad things, and then there was the other things. So the point is that once you get in a bad mood, if negative things, the things that you remembered when you were in a similar state become more easily retrieved, and when you're in a bad mood, you begin to remember all the things that you remembered when you were in a bad state, which are generally negative things. And so you can easily imagine how this creates a cycling effect. Okay. So in summary, em emotions consist of physiological, behavioral, and conscious responses. The physiological responses are mediated by the autonomic nervous system, which can produce the fight or flight. There's considerable debate about how these are related, and I won't go into these, um, but you can read about it in the textbook. And these emotions are thought to be universal and strongly shared through many species, but also shaped by culture. Uh, we can't be certain if animals have the same emotional experiences, but 
all the other data suggests that what animals experience is similar to our own. And fear learning can be studied both from fear conditioning, which is classical conditioning paradigm, or escape learning, which is a form of negative reinforcement instrumental conditioning. Okay. Um, and emotion can increase in coding, such as in these flashbulb memories. Um, and they don't, although the event, the, the fact that the memory ex is there doesn't decay, the, the details can become confused over time. So let me just take a break for a second. Any questions? So in terms of brain substrate, the amygdala is the central player in the story. There's nobody here who's in Paray Lab, so, well, I guess M uh, Mohammed. So, Emotion has a very complex relationship. A single emotion can activate many brain regions, and the same brain region can be affected by many emotions. So it's not the case that there's going to be, this was an attempt to take the uh, five key emotions and relate them to the brain. As you can see, it's sort of a mess. There's no real locus. Um, but the one brain that's region that stands out for emotions, particularly for fear, is the amygdala. And this is. Um, you should all be able to uh, create a mental image of this and reproduce it. Um, this shows you the basic circuitry for fear conditioning. Um, uh, amygdala means almond in Greek, and, uh, which is ironic because a lot of fear conditioning studies use almond flavor or smell as a, as a stimulus. Um, and it's many different nuclei, and a lot of the work by Denis Pere and others have been on dissociating these. The lateral nucleus, the basal lateral nucleus, and the central nucleus. Um, and the subcortical nuclei collect emotional stimuli, coordinate emotional responses, and modulate brain centers for memory. And they do it in different ways. And we'll talk about each of them in, in turn. The central nucleus um, is, uh, organizes the expression of emotional responses. So if you remember here, the central nucleus is the output pathway. Okay. Stimulation of it can cause uh, species-specific defensive responses, freezing, lowered heart rate, okay, so as if you're bypassing the circuit and going straight to the output. In humans, it can cause either positive or negative emotions and outbursts of rage. Um, I suspect given 1971, that's not our Delgado. Um, and disruption leads to impairments of emotional learning. Um, the uh, this is some, uh, some studies of the central amygdala. It's, it's critical for fear conditioning, this sort of this basic fear response. So here you have a CS, a colored shape, paired with a blast of noise. And we're looking at the, uh, the skin conductance response. And we're looking here at, this is amygdala people with amygdala lesions or hippocampal lesions, and those with, uh, again, the same in rats. And what you see is that this learning of freezing in rats or skin conductance in humans is impaired with amygdala damage. Um, the central nucleus organizes the expression. It's the output pathway, so it can cause, oh wait, we just did this already. Okay. The lateral, let me get here. Um, the lateral amygdala is the input pathway. Okay. Um, it collects the inputs and it seems to encode the emotional relevance. It's, it's part of a fast and rough direct pathway um, from the thalamus um, with minimal processing. So the idea is that for a lot of fear stimuli, time is of the essence. You want to be able to react quickly. And you're also perhaps more willing to, be, to err on the side of caution, to be defensive. Okay? Um, it's, there's also a, a slow but accurate information from the cortex. And so uh, uh, Joe Ledoux has a diagram, which it would be nice to put here, but I don't, that shows somebody walking in the woods um, and seeing a snake. And the idea is that there's a there's a part of the, the, the sort of a fast pathway that sort of recognizes that as a possible threat shape, and you can see the immediate response even before you recognize what it is. Do you want to say something? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Um, and then emotional learning refines the neural responses in the lateral amygdala, so that what's happening during learning is that uh, um, you're beginning to sort of you get sort of two pathways: the, the, the direct and the indirect. Um, here is, again, where I said the use of the, the amygdala odor, the, uh, the, the almond odor. Um, if you pair this odor with a foot shock, um, I'll look at this for a second, um, activity, this is activity in the lateral nucleus. So this is the input pathway where stimuli are being processed. What you see is that initially, there's the same response to these two odors. But after the almond odor is paired with a shock, 
is much more responding. So it suggests that the lateral nucleus is developing a sensitivity to stimuli that are associated with the fear response. Those are becoming ever more sensitive. Um, this is that same task I told you about before, the hospital story that has either the training, you know, the, 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 the drill version or the, the really accident version. And uh, uh, that was that, that story before. Imaging studies show that the emotional events will activate the amygdala, and the degree of amygdala activation will predict the boost for the emotional material. So the idea is that the degree to which somebody shows a preference for re remembering emotional data versus the non-emotional data will be correlated with the degree to which there is more activity in the, their amygdala. Um, the basolateral amygdala okay, is the third thing. I should, we should actually, for these slides, actually have the, the schematic here throughout. But um, modulates memory to increase the storage of emotional memories. Um, and the way this is believed to take place is by inputs from the hormonal system and outputs of the hippocampus. Okay, here's the circuit again. So the central nucleus, this is how we can sort of activate the output pathways, the output pathway. The lateral nucleus is this input, the processing of the stimuli. And the basal lateral is what mediates a lot of the sort of the memory storage and modulation. Okay? And all of this in turn also gets modulated by stress hormones coming in. Okay. So um, epinephrine is one of these, uh, okay, one of these sort of stress hormones that's released from the adrenal gland into the brain stem to the nucleus. And altering it is one way of studying the circuit, you know, by, by artificially going in. You can see here that you have, this is a, a rat's given a foot shock upon entering a chamber, um, and then it will hesitate before you go in. Um, if you um, enhance epinephrine, then you can enhance the avoidance response. And this just shows that the more you delay, the less effective it is. So that you really want to give the epinephrine right at the time when it's being, when it's being shocked, and that will enhance its sort of avoidance learning. And you can do the opposite thing where you can block epinephrine and see that you the animal fails to learn this avoidance. So to recap, the central nucleus organizes the expression, the lateral amygdala collects inputs and encodes the emotional relevance, and the basal lateral modulates memory storage to increase the details associated. But there's still debate, does the amygdala actually store these memories, or is it just organize the activity? And it's similar to the debate about the hippocampus. Does the hippocampus store things permanently, or does it develop representations that are used by other brain regions? So I'm going to actually skip over, let's see, I'm going to skip over this section here. Um, and I just want to talk now about the clinical perspectives for a bit, and then I'm going to turn over to Mohammed, who will talk a little bit more about that. So the two areas of relevance are phobias. So phobias are negative emotions and high stress. Negative emotions and high stress can cause physical problems and physiological problems, particularly anxiety disorders. So a phobia, uh, how many people here are scared of snakes? How many people here, yeah? You just went right out. You just, you, I can see the pilo erection on your back of your neck from here. Uh huh. We should try a little Harold. What's a little Harold? What's it? Baby Watson, a little experiment with you. you know, shock you every time you show you a snake and see if we can really. Um, uh, I bet I didn't. I did, uh, did, anybody, did anybody know this word before? Ophidiophobia. Bet you didn't know you were ophidiophobic. You're, okay, um, agoraphobia we've heard of. So best explains the rising through classical conditioning. You know, maybe you were associated with snakes. It could be cultural. Um, stimulus is almost always something that was threatening to human ancestors. So we tend to have a biological predisposition to certain things. So um, uh, it's more likely to be develop phobias to snakes than to for rabbits. Um, but not everyone has a fear evoking experience develops a phobia. Um, and so you can also have social transmission, as you talked about in, in, in certain cultures, snakes are considered, you know, evil. Um, general therapies involve desensitization. That's basically, um, maybe first I'll make you sort of sit there with a, a picture of a snake in front of you, um, and then I'll make you sort of sit there with a, fur, a fake snake that's obviously fake, and you know it's fake, until you kind of habituate, and then a snake in a cage. And finally, to graduate, you'll have to sort of pick up a, a, a boa constrictor and sit with it for five minutes. Okay. Um, 
And so the idea is that you're sort of starting from the least fearful to the most fearful and moving sort of forward. Um, PTSD, which is something we study in our lab um, and also in Catherine's lab, are obsessive thoughts, nightmares, and flashbacks that persist long after exposure. The trigger may be many different stimuli that are reminiscent of initial trauma. Um, so for someone who, who's had a blast exposure while driving in a tank, they may develop uh, PTSD symptoms to being in any uh, narrow environment, such as like an elevator can, can yield it. Someone who's been raped may feel it whenever they're alone, whenever they're with a man or somebody else. So uh, and there's a whole constellation of stress responses. Um, so this looks at the time since the event, the patterns of psychological recovery. This looks like disruptions in normal functioning. Um, so after some traumatic event, maybe about a third to a half of the people are just fine. Nothing happened. Um, about 15, another third of the people are very traumatized initially, but they, you know, in time, six months to a year or so, recover. Okay. But PTSD is what happens when after six months or a year when people this hasn't recovered. So you want to be able to make it clear that it's not, PTSD is not just, you know, the day after the marathon that you're running and you get bombed, you know, you're going to be pretty discombobulated. That's not PTSD. You know, you expect that for a lot of the people who are involved in a traumatic event. If six months or a year later, you can't go outside, you, you get upset running and so forth, then that would be diagnosed. It has to be persistent and long lasting. Um, cortisol levels remain high and persistent. Epinephrine can increase without corresponding cortisol release. So the fear response will last longer. Um, and Muhammad can tell us a little bit more about cortisol and epinephrine and how they interrelate. Um, and there are some drugs that have been, propranolol interferes with epinephrine and it can, one way of reducing stress reactions. Um, and so one of the, so one of the therapies involved uh, administering it. Um, the question is, when do you administer it? Do you administer it right at the trauma? And I think this is what Arik Sh Shalev was doing, right? So it's taking people in accidents who've just been in very traumatic accidents, giving them epinephrine at the accident. The idea is that if you give this to them um, right, re right after the trauma, they won't forget any of the salient events so much, but the, the, the cycle of this PTSD can be reduced. Um, and MRI studies indicate that individuals with PTSD typically have smaller hippocampal volume. This is a study by Mark Gilbertson and Scott Orr, with whom we've worked in our lab, that shows that not only do veterans with PTSD um, have a, uh, a smaller hippocampus, but their twins, who never went to war, also have a smaller hippocampus. So the idea is that people had a long time thought that small hippocampus was a consequence of PTSD. This, these twin studies, so there's basically twins, two brothers, it's all brothers, one of whom went to the Vietnam War, developed PTSD, the other twin stayed home and became a psychologist or an accountant and didn't have PTSD. Turns out both of them have small hippocampuses. So the idea is that a small hippocampus doesn't cause PTSD, but a small hippocampus puts you at risk for PTSD if you're then exposed to a traumatic event. So in summary, anxiety disorders reflect fear responses going awry. Phobias are excessive fears that interfere with daily life. In PTSD, a natural fear reaction does not subside with time and may overgeneralize.